Sports car racing enthusiast James Coons had competed in events around the country for years. On March 31st, 1989, James set out on a 165-mile drive to a racetrack through the hot California desert with an extremely dangerous cargo. My husband had his van and trailer with eight barrels of gas and our two dogs, Teddy and Hillary. I know you keep waiting for I'm nothing but a hound dog. We don't have kids. Those are our kids. They're the light at the center of our life. He had no placards on it. He had no permit to be hauling that much fuel. It's a higher octane fuel, and actually the flash point on it, the point of ignition is a lot lower than the uh, lower octane fuels. Several areas there are uh, bad winds that will catch high-profile vehicles, and they will go over. Winds were blowing through the canyons that day at speeds of 40 miles an hour. The wreckage of the van could not be seen from the highway. Days went by, and no help came. On Sunday, when Kitty Coons returned from visiting out-of-town relatives, she expected to find her husband James at home. I tried to say to myself, well, you know, he's talking with his buddies. He won't be home till late. I figured, okay, the latest he would be home, if he stayed till they cleaned up the track, the latest possible time that he would be home would be 9 o'clock. And when 9 o'clock came and he wasn't there, I got really uncomfortable. And then I started doing scenarios in my head. Okay, he's had an accident, he's got a flat tire, and I really wasn't worried if he had had a breakdown because all the racers would be coming home. And it's like one big family. I mean, they'd stop and help him. By 5 o'clock, I knew that something was really wrong. And they first called a friend, and I said, what time did James leave the track last night? And she said, he never arrived. And when I realized that he'd never arrived, I knew that he'd either had a heart attack or had an accident. The sheriff's office came, and I ex explained to him what had happened, and he asked me a lot of questions. And it didn't really start to hit home till he started asking for a description. And I realized that they might be looking for a body. And I called my friend Karen, and I told her that James was missing. And she said she would come over. And I said, you know, I, I, I don't want to be alone if I find out he's dead. And because I really didn't have any other family. I have no brothers or sisters. I have nobody. It was James, Hillary, and Teddy. That's the only family I have. San Diego County sheriffs, including Lieutenant George Neshaw, searched the rocky 75-mile stretch of highway. Under the circumstances, it was something that would be appropriate to go look for him with a helicopter because it's uh, a long road and it's windy and windy and there are sheer cliffs on the side and a, a person could crash over the edge and uh, people looking for him from car probably wouldn't be able to see him. Okay, we've got a lot of wind coming across here too. I think that might be a factor. Yeah. There it is. When we first saw the van, we were real sure that it was an unsurvivable crash. The task at hand at that point was fairly grim. I had to walk up and decide uh, whether the guy was dead or alive, and I've obviously encountered dead people before in this line of work, and 
after having been on desert floor for three days, I knew that I'd probably be able to smell him before I got real close to the van. The closer I got, I could smell something that was dead. It was real surprising. Somebody actually answered back. I was completely shocked that he was alive, and it's quite a thrill. Task history, we've located the, the van over the side, uh, almost down into the desert towards Akatia, eastbound 8. Uh, we found the subject is alive in the van. We're going to need life flight, uh, rescue, and fire department, code 3. The homicide officer called me to tell me that they found him, and I said, what's wrong? What's happened? And he said, his van and trailer went over the side of the mountain, but he's alive. And I said, are the dogs alive? And he said, I don't know. But he's alive. I said, how badly hurt? We don't know, but he's alive. Rescue and hazardous materials teams from Imperial County arrived on the scene. Although James had managed to survive three days in the 90 degree heat, he was still trapped inside the crushed van. Paramedics were unable to reach James to treat him. He could have died from dehydration. It was the hotter part of the year, so he could have died of a heat stroke. But he was oriented. He knew where he was at, and he knew what was going on. Volunteer Fire Chief Robert Klein was one of the first on the scene. There was too much fuel leaking, and it was highly flammable. There was fumes that would burn your eyes down there. If you take one spark with those fumes, you're going to get a big flash, and then all eight drums are going to go up. The large quantities of highly flammable fuel made any attempt to rescue James extremely risky. The extrication was put off because of the possibility of a spark. We phoned the area. We decided on removing the drums before we went any further with it. EMT Wanda Roth made her way down to the wreck. My assignment was basically to get to the victim. I could not see his face, the lower half of him, or anything else. I was sitting down there saying, OK, now just nobody light any cigarettes or spark off anything because, I mean, I didn't want to be blown apart, but uh, it was my job to sit there and talk to him, so that's what I was assigned, so that's what I did. The next thing was to locate a crane with a 60-foot boom. Because the 55-gallon drums were too dangerous to remove by hand, a 50-ton crane was brought in. One thing, no spark. Mike King headed the crane crew. Our only concern was being able to take the barrels off in the right sequence. You pull the wrong one off, and then the whole thing tumbled, because we were afraid that if it did, that there might be some explosion. Night had fallen by the time the first barrel could be removed. The crane operator in the process of lifting those barrels off could not see the vehicle where we had it set up. He could not see over the edge. Basically, he was told to swing left and right, boom up and down, and lower his hoist, raise his hoist. So he was basically working blind. By early evening, Kitty arrived at the scene of her husband's accident. It was funny when I was standing there looking down, and there were literally 20, 30, 40 volunteer fire, ambulance, paramedics, and I thought, I volunteered hundreds of hours at the UCSD Medical Center. And I looked down and I thought, I've always believed what comes around goes around. And there they were. There were all those hours down there coming back to me. Look what I found. The dirty fear all soap. All of a sudden, Wanda, one of the volunteers, came up. And she had my dog, Hillary. And I couldn't believe it. Hillary had stayed by her master's side on the desert floor for three days and three nights. Wanda she had been with James for eight hours in the heat and I've never seen anyone look so exhausted you know I said how is he and she said well he's he's conscious and she said I can't I couldn't see him but you know I can talk to him there was no room to pry open the smashed doors the rescuers used the crane to lift the van so they could use the jaws of life I just want to watch your face when you open that door After more than 70 hours, James was finally pulled out of the wreckage. 
He had uh, multiple contusions and abrasions throughout his entire body. He also had first-degree burns and second-degree burns to his abdomen and groin area from the fuel being spilled on him. Uh, gasoline is corrosive, so it's going to cause burns if it's on you for any, any length of time. Here is James, completely soaked, bloody, dirty, in horrible shape, and he looks up and says, what took you so long? <laughs> I can't believe it. That is so typical of James. It all depends on the individual and how long it's going to take him to get dehydrated. Just from looking at the wreckage and considering how long he'd been in that vehicle over the hill, it was pretty amazing that the guy survived. Though James received skin grafts and had to have part of his foot amputated, he survived where many others had died. I knew I was trapped. My foot had caught between the drive shaft of the steering column and the engine. But I couldn't pull my foot out of the shoe. I tried that. I figured that I could get on the CB radio or I could flash my lights, but the battery got smashed right off the front, so I had no power. I just couldn't believe no one could see me. And then I thought, well, maybe they think it's, you know, it's an old crash. It's just some old truck body that blew over or something. So if I make some noise, they'll stop. So I started hollering, help. Well, then I realized, these people are not going to be able to hear me. And that's when I really started, you know, thinking, okay, what have I got to get out? In the seat behind me, I had a, a hunting knife, a double-edged hunting knife. Hunger never entered my mind. But water, water became the, the only thing that I thought about. And then I got thinking, you know, I might have to cut my foot off to get out of here. And of course, then after I lost the knife, it was academic. What are you going to cut your foot off with, your fingers? I start calling for Hillary. You OK, girl? You could hear huh? underneath the van something moving around. Kind of scary, huh? The saddest thing is when I realized Teddy was dead. It was very frustrating to, I suppose it's the way a parent feels when they do something, have a car accident, and lose a child. You think, well, I, if I'd have left him at home, or he had been on the floor with Hillary, instead of sitting on my lap like he likes to do. I told him I was sorry. I didn't mean to do it. Nine months later, James has returned to racing. I appreciate the chance to go on. That, that's the one thing that I, I do appreciate. My husband survived because he's an Ozark mountain man. What kept him alive was his thinking thinking of ways to get out. He never would believe that he could die.